I won't mince words, I'll let the title speak for itself. I'm going to tell you about the holiest foreskin in Christianity. This is the legend of the Holy Prepus, the Holy Hood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the J-Man, was Jewish, and like all Jewish boys eight days after he was born, he was circumcised. This ritual, called a bris, has been a Jewish tradition for thousands of years, beginning over 2,000 years before Jesus was born and continuing up to today. According to tradition, the foreskin would have been wrapped in a cloth and buried. However, Jesus wasn't any ordinary Jewish baby. According to legend, a woman who recognized the importance of the baby took the foreskin and saved it in a jar of preservation oil. If Christian doctrine is to be believed, Jesus' body physically ascended to heaven. But a few parts of him remain. There is some blood, his umbilical cord, and, you guessed it, his discarded foreskin. The first known appearance of the devotional dirt jacket dates back to Charles the Great, or Charlemagne as you might know him. According to his account, Charlemagne was visited by an angel that gave him his messianic magician's cloak as a gift that he then re-gifted to Pope Leo III on his coronation in 800 AD. It is from here, the legend says, that the holy foreskin went to Rome. Maybe. There's actually another story that the hallowed turtleneck that was sent to Rome was actually a fake, and that Charlemagne kept the real one. He took it deep into rural France and hid it in a church in Conque. They claim to have it today in a special box that nobody can look inside. However, the most accepted story is that the angelic beanie went to Rome. It was after this when the foreskin enjoyed centuries of being one of the tip-top relics in Christianity. A cut above the rest, if you will. It even enjoyed a few centuries in the Vatican's Sanctum Sanctorum, the Holy of Holies, where the most important relics in Christendom exist to this day. 14th century doctor of the church, St. Catherine of Siena claimed that she was the spiritual bride of Christ. And that in a dream, Christ came to her and gave her his foreskin as a wedding ring. She claimed to be able to see it on her hand her whole life. If you ask me, I think she got shafted on the wedding gift. In the 15th century, the foreskin went to England to help Henry V's queen Catherine of Valois to get pregnant. There's a joke here, but I don't know what it is. It's at the tip of my tongue, though. There were skeptics, though, that the Immaculate Jacket was on Earth. Some theologians like Leo Alatius in the 17th century theorized that the foreskin did ascend to heaven with Christ and that it became the Rings of Saturn. In the medieval and early modern period, relics like the Holy Foreskin became a source of big business. Churches collected the remains and belongings of all of the saints, apostles, and holy figures they could, and watched closely for miracles. Well-known relics would draw huge crowds for Christians on pilgrimage, and that meant big bucks for big-ticket relics. Churches would, on occasion, even steal relics from each other, in a medieval heist movie we are tragically deprived from. So it's no surprise, then, that you found a few... duplicates. Not only were there as many as 21 godly kennies around Europe, and several heads of John the Baptist. Some claim that this was just a miracle. Moore just didn't pay much attention to it. As the Enlightenment began to take hold, claims of the Holy Hood began to experience criticism. Protestants mocked it mercilessly, and the church became more and more uncomfortable with the concept of the foreskin of Christ being on earth. It actually caused a lot of theological issues because Catholics believed in something called transubstantiation. Catholics debated to which degree this is metaphorical or literal, but when the Catholics take the Eucharist, eat this bread for it is my body, etc., some theologians believe that the wafer actually became a hunk of Jesus meat going down the throat. The prepuce muddied this debate because it meant that the Eucharist could be done in a very literal way. Another blow to the prestige of the prepuce happened when German mercenaries sacked Rome in 1527. Among the objects stolen was the seraphic skin ring. It went missing for a number of decades until it resurfaced in a small village called Calcutta, 30 miles outside of Rome. But more on that later. The church spoke about it less and less. And eventually in the year 1900, the church banned discussion of the holy foreskin, claiming that acknowledging it would turn it into, quote, an irreverent curiosity. Speaking about the foreskin would result in excommunication. And during the Second Vatican Council, or Vatican II, they increased the sentence to some sort of special super excommunication. However, much to the chagrin of the Vatican, the foreskin in Calcutta remained a local relic. They couldn't refer to it anymore as a foreskin, nor let anybody else see it except for one day a year. They would only whip it out on January 1st, during the no longer observed festival of the circumcision of Christ. So the Vatican didn't make a big fuss. 
This changed when Calcutta was moved in the 1960s because they were afraid an earthquake would actually destroy the village. In the new village, 60s beatniks actually began to move in. And curious about the foreskin began to write about it for a wider circle. It became increasingly popular, and the Vatican became increasingly uncomfortable with it. In 1983, the local priest, Dardo Magnoni, claims that his home was broken into while he was away visiting Rome, and that the holy foreskin, for some reason kept in his wardrobe, was stolen. Who knows, maybe he was trying for a pregnancy. Some suspected that the priest sold it, or that thieves took it to sell on the black market. Some blame neo-Nazis or Satanists. But the suspect most people believe took the foreskin today was the Vatican itself. They claim that Magnoni took the foreskin to the Vatican and that they are holding on to it, making sure that such an embarrassing relic never sees the light of day again. At least one author and one National Geographic documentary have circumscribed the globe to find it, but they hit a dead end instead of a bell end. The Holy Foreskin is an interesting artifact to discuss because of the strange relationship that Christianity has with circumcision. Many churches and artists had paintings depicting the circumcision of Christ and celebrated it for centuries, but had no requirement of it for their own people. Catholics believe that the circumcision has been replaced with the baptism. Moreover, circumcision was a symbol of Judaism and often used as another weapon of anti-Semitism in times like the Spanish Inquisition. As early as the 5th century, early Christians were distancing Jesus from his Jewishness. Some argue that because Christ's father was not human, he wasn't really Jewish. The circumcision of Jesus Christ, then, was in an uncomfortable position and needed explanation. Hard to do when there's 21 foreskins dancing around Europe. I know this all sounds silly, and it is. But this is just one example of the power of relics in pre-enlightenment Christianity. The foreskin is one of many relics that were not only big business, but to many devout followers of Christianity, a physical link between the earthly and the divine. Often they were used as literal sources of protection or used in healing. People would wear the bones of saints to protect them from harm. And to this day, people touch relics for healing purposes. There's one strange story of a group of monks that took the bones of a saint and put it in a barrel of wine and drank that wine to protect them against a very virulent plague that was infecting their town. It's important to see these practices to show that, in many ways, the past really is another planet. In this case, the rings of Saturn. We have a hard time imagining it, but the line between natural and supernatural didn't exist. And scientific ideas about how health and disease worked were centuries from forming. The foreskin is just a strange example of that. Religion is always way bigger, more complicated, and full of way more discussion, debate, and nuance than they appear from the outside. This video took a lot of very particular expertise. I want to give a special thanks to Andrew Henry from the channel Religion for Breakfast. He runs a channel that's a secular study of religion, and he gave me a lot of help with the research for this video. Check out what he's up to and tell him I sent you. If you have any comments about the puns in this episode, some of which may have seemed forced, or forced kin, please direct your complaints and or tip of the hats to myself and Art Explains down in the comments. Don't worry, we're already extremely pleased and ashamed of ourselves. If this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe down below. I'm going to do a few short Q&A videos. So if you have a burning question about me or history, send it along in the comments. Or upload a video of you asking a question and send it to me. Video submissions get first dibs. And of course, a special thanks to my patrons. You're keeping the channel going. And all Patreon funds go towards new equipment. So check it out for some sweet perks. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next Step Back. Ooh.